the Rangers added insult to injury in the worst series in franchise history. We're talking about the miserable collapse, the end of the Rangers season, and some terrible, horrible, no good, very bad news. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's show, we are breaking down why Igor Shosturkin is the best goaltender in the NHL. I'm just kidding. This hasn't become a New York Rangers podcast overnight. I'm Bryce Patrick, host of the Locked On Texas Rangers podcast, diehard Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all four, five seasons of this podcast. Today is Thursday, September 7th. Your Rangers are 76 and 63, and they are a half game out of a playoff spot as we sit today. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Subscribe on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to, I don't know, Say something nice about your life that doesn't involve Texas Rangers baseball in the comments below, because my goodness, I mean, I thought it couldn't get much worse than the first two games of this series, but, but no, 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 your 2023 Texas Rangers said, hold up, someone hold my beer while I try and do this backflip off of the house into the pool, and they snapped their necks in embarrassing fashion, giving up 12 runs in a 12-3 to loss that was only three because of Marcus Simeon's um, Sisyphusian day, I will call it. Four hits, three RBIs, drove in all of the Rangers' runs, a pair of homers, a couple of singles, and a stolen base. I mean, I have so much respect for Marcus Simeon. Honestly, I really do. In a game, in a series, in a season that has just fallen away, Marcus Simeon said no, screw this, I'm putting this team on my back, I am doing everything I can to get this team to win, even if it's going to be in a blowout loss, and honestly, I feel like this really, this game really encapsulates who Marcus Simeon is as a guy, why you want him as a leader on your team, he is going to give you his absolute everything, no matter what, no matter the score, he is going to try his hardest, work his butt off, thanklessly, without much recognition in a game where there was honestly just so, so very little to, you know, not make you want to cry and scream and throw up watching the Texas Rangers play baseball because, I mean, again, it only took basically three innings for this game to be out of hand. Max Scherzer went only just three innings allowed, seven earned runs, including three home runs, and on one of those home runs... Uh, that Adoles Garcia heroically tried to save. Uh, He ended up tweaking his knee. He is going to be out for we don't know how long or if he's going to be out. We'll see if he plays on Friday or what the deal is there. But if he has to go on the IL, that will be five different Texas Rangers All-Stars that have gone on the IL for this season, even in a small stint. And if you want to say six because you want to count Jacob DeGrom as an All-Star level talent, which you should, um then i mean it's just it's just honestly insane the only all-star who hasn't been injured at all this season is marcus simeon and that's because marcus simeon is is just the iron man of baseball now and um it's really impressive to see him go out there every day and not take a day off and only missed one game last year and that was because he was in the worst start to any season he's ever had in his career otherwise he would have played all 162 that year as well um, but it's it's impressive, and i got to give a, a huge shout-out to Marcus Simeon. Also, most of this bullpen was okay in the lowest leverage situations. I mean, Chris Stratton, of course, did give up a, a run. Uh, Jose LeClerc worked a score, and then Cody Bradford inning two-third scores. Aroldis Chapman, uh, perfect inning in the lowest leverage situation. Uh, cool. Um, and then Brock Burke in just the most I want to be done with this series more than I want to be done with anything in my life comes in and he allows a pair of home runs, a walk, four hits, four runs. It's just so incredibly deflating. And one of those home runs was just the absolute wall scraping as wall scraper three run shot. I mean, it's just like, you've got to be freaking kidding me at this point. I will give you the good news. The Rangers can't lose today and they can't lose again to the Astros until, well, at least the ALDS it's looking like. So that's nice. 
that's a really nice feather in your cap. Can't lose today. Play the A's this weekend. Uh, win some of those. Feel a little bit of baseball joy. I won't say that I'll feel hope that this team is actually making the playoffs or let alone doing something when they get there because it's just been such an incredibly horrible, no good, very bad week. But, um, yeah, I mean, there there are some very, very slight positives. But it's just incredibly frustrating game that, all right, the seri- first two games of the series really didn't go your way, could not have gone much worse. At least you have Scherzer out there on the hill. Scherzer, who's been incredibly good so far with the Rangers in almost every single game, even the game where he did struggle in his, his first game out there. Um, he still bounced back really well from that one and overall had a pretty decent start. He had one start where he went three and a third innings and just could not get right and then he had this one where he just got absolutely freaking shelled by the Astros who they're, they're your daddies they're, they're, you, there's no other way around it unfortunately like uh, Big Poppy said it very well um, they're, they're my daddies I mean there, there's no other way around it and it sucks and it's so incredibly frustrating and you know it'd be really nice for there to be just some other cheating scandal that comes out so we can blame it on this but the fact of the matter is the Houston Astros are just a better baseball team than the Rangers. This was this was the season to take advantage of it, though. This was the season to take advantage of a down year. So many injuries to the Astros, to their key players, to their so much of their starting rotation, and so much regression, too, from their starting rotation. I mean, from Rivaldez is, I mean, he don't carve up the Rangers, but he has been fairly inconsistent for his standards this season, and Verlander has been, you know, pretty good for them, but not great by any means. And, uh, you know, their lineup had a lot of key injuries, missing Jose Altuve. Oh, the other good news from this game is Jose Altuve didn't homer. Um, so that was nice. 0 for 4 with a strikeout. Um, so, yay. Something <laughs> something to put your hat on in this horrible series from hell that basically killed all hope and optimism in Rangers land. I don't think it killed it for the players. Maybe it did. Um, but it definitely seems like it didn't kill it from Marcus Simeon. And that is a very good thing that Simeon and I'm hoping Bochi and I'm hoping that most of this group isn't nearly as, um, you know, living and dying and just so down in the doldrums and completely hopeless. Like it seems like this entire fan base is not that the fan base shouldn't be, but the, the players I don't think should be because they have have a lot more belief in themselves than I think the fans do at this moment. I, I'm, I'm glad for them. I'm, gl- I'm glad for them having that belief in themselves because for the most part this season, this team has been very good. And that's what's so incredibly frustrating to watch this season just go completely down the drain of you know 120 games being th- one of the best teams in all of Major League Baseball and then to have it all come crashing down and the hopefully the end of the crash just the all right we're, we're done we're crashed we're dead um to have it be such a loud exclamation mark to the team that you hate the most is just about as bad as it gets coming up we're going to look at a little bit of why everything came crushing down and if it's time for evan carter to maybe spark this team on some kind of hope down the stretch but first this word from our sponsors This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. And uh, it seems like the Rangers parts are not fitting just right. But if you want yours to fit just right, the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits just right the first time around or your money back. Because just like in, uh, just add your ride to my garage look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back like i just said because like in sports confidence is the name of the game when you shop on ebay motors and with over 122 million parts to choose from you'll be back in the game in no time after all it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed get the right parts the right fit and the right prices on ebaymotors.com let's ride ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers eligible items only exclusions apply Shout out to the Everyday Rangers for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. On Friday's show, I'll be talking about the the miners and, you know, what's going on on the farm and maybe some prospects to give this team some hope from 2024. The Rangers take on the A's this weekend. You can catch every pitch with the hometown broadcast on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, injuries have played a huge part for the Rangers. They've played, um, they've played a big part for just about everybody in Major League Baseball, you can't really chalk too much up to injuries, but the amount and the severity of these injuries to the caliber of players that they've happened to has just been so incredibly 
overwhelming. I mean, we saw which how good Mitch Garver is missing him for what was six weeks. It felt like you know, almost two months. It <laughs> felt like a long time. That ended up being, I mean, he wasn't going as, as well, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to write it off. He was, he was doing very, very well, very, very, very well to start the season, but he missed a significant time. Corey Seager missed six weeks and then another two weeks. Um, and then has missed some games here and there because of different injuries. But when he's been on, he's been the best player in baseball. And by the way, Corey Seager for the first time this year, the first time since I believe the middle of last year had back to back hitless games. That's the first time all season Corey Seager has not had a game in two, not had a hit in two straight games. And I think the only reason for that is because he was pulled after two at bats in the Tuesday game. It's just kind of bonkers to think about, even in a game where Seager goes over four with a strikeout. It's just like, oh, wait, he's just that good. That's kind of insane. But getting literally a month out of Jacob DeGrom, missing, you know, almost two months feels like maybe a month and a half, six weeks from Nathan Eovaldi, and we'll, we'll see how much he can give the Rangers the next time out. Maybe just not facing the Astros will be, I don't know, something that will help him not give up, uh, what was it, four runs and an inning and a third. Uh, maybe that'll be nice. Maybe Scherzer will be able to bounce back from this forearm strain that really messed him up today and was the reason why he was pulled early in the, in the after six innings against the Twins in a game where the Rangers ended up losing last Saturday. Or maybe, you know, he'll go and get Tommy John surgery and he'll be done next year as well. And, you know, he's just going to retire and everything's going to go to crap. And then Nathan Uvalde is also going to get Tommy John surgery and everything's just going to go completely down the toilet. Honestly, it feels it feels like just one of those things that's like, yeah, why not just expect that? Because I don't know what, what why would I expect nice things from this Texas Rangers team at this moment in time, even though they're playing the A's this weekend? It's like, well, who cares? Honestly, I, I care. I care a little bit. I still have the smallest bit of hope in this team. Not not a rational hope, but just like, just come on. Just, just, just do it, okay? Just do the thing that you did for the first two months of the season. And the way this team was built, I mean, there were definitely a lot of questions from the outside. I thought it was a smart move, and I, I, st- I still think it's not the, the best way to completely rebuild the team. Because obviously, you got to have some seller years and like just bottom of the seller and also you're a seller at the trade deadline years. And the Rangers didn't really do that. I mean, ownership didn't want to bottom out and be utterly terrible and embrace that, except for in 2021. I mean, they kind of were able to embrace that because they had a a pretty big collapse in 2020 in that shortened season, which like it's not that big a collapse because it's literally only 60 games. But the Rangers thought of those contenders for the first half and then... Then the Slam Diego week happened, and it was like, okay, yep, all right, let's let's trade off some pieces, let's let's start this rebuild early, and I appreciate them for only being really truly in the tank for the back half of a shortened 2020 season, and then 2021, and well, they were at least interesting in 2022. They weren't good, but you had Corey Seager there and Marcus Simeon there and Adolis Garcia there, and it was like, okay. There, there's some pieces there that you can kind of dream on. And, and Martin Perez had himself a good season. It was it was overall pretty rough, but building through free agency and not having that young core that's, you know, really established and ready before you go and spend big on free agency um, is, is a precarious way to build a baseball team. But if you're not going to embrace the full tank and the rebuild and you don't just have, you know, the smartest front office in baseball like the Dodgers or the Rays or... Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say those two are, or the Braves, really. Um, then, then you're not going to be able to just you know come out of nowhere and be amazing and stay amazing for years and years and years to come. You got to take some risks. And signing Jacob Degrom to that five-year deal was obviously a risk. But again, I will always say a risk worth taking. Signing Corey Seager, who had had some injury history and some questions, and the Dodgers weren't willing to max him out and pay him to be their franchise you know, star, even though he won them a World Series MVP, like he, he was incredible and a big reason why they won that World Series and many, many years of trying, he just single handedly willed them in the postseason to a championship. And they said, even though we've got more money than God, uh, we're good. We're not gonna pay you a whole bunch of money to be our star shortstop of the future. Um even though you won us a championship. Even the Yankees, who have so much incredible money, instead of going and signing Corey Seager or anybody else, a place where I think he 
everyone, you know, Sully has been ranting for the last, like, three years that Corey Seager should have been a New York Yankee. But instead, the Yankees decided to, um, well, basically trade for Isaiah kiner Falefa instead of doing that. There, I don't think there was anybody else that was going to go 10 years on Corey Seager, let alone $325 million. But the Rangers did. That risk seems to have paid off. Going seven years, $175 million for Marcus Simeon. Both of those risks seem to have paid off in a big, big way. A bunch of these smart little deals like getting Jonah Heim in that trade for Elvis Andrews and getting Adolis Garcia for cash considerations. Drafting Josh Young. That's a great move. I mean, trading for Nathaniel Lowe. Great move. Signing John Gray. Pretty good move. And making all these other signings. You had to take some risks when you're trying to, you know, shortcut, bypass the hard hardest part of building a contender. And the Ra- the Rangers, for the most part, did a decent job of of doing everything they needed to do to be contenders. It just feels like everything went wrong. The regression to the mean happened literally all at once in the most painful, agonizing, frustrating, unbelievable way. Honestly, it's just unbelievable with how good this team has been. Uh, despite its flaws, obviously the bullpen could have been addressed a little bit better, but like most of the hard part was done of acquiring a pretty good rotation, acquiring a really good lineup, acquiring great coaches from everywhere except for it seems like the bullpen. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, they did the toughest part in getting some aces and some, you know, six, seven win players and some stars on the margins. They did that, but it seems like all of it is really catching up to them in the worst way. And I don't don't think, you know, by any means, you know, next year is going to be a slog or this is a, some kind of omen that the Rangers will never, ever win anything, but it is most definitely incredibly frustrating to watch, even though the future looks pretty bright with some of the young stars they have down in the minor leagues. And one of them could be on his way to Arlington in the near future. Coming up, we're going to look a little bit at Evan Carter if it's time to call him up, depending on what happens with the Adolis Garcia injury. But first, this word from our sponsors. Shout out to the Everydayers making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. On Monday's show, I'll be breaking down this weekend's series against the A's. The Rangers take on Oakland this weekend. You can catch every pitch with the hometown broadcast on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, the Rangers got some bad news in the middle of this game that, uh, that Adoles Garcia had to be taken out with a knee injury trying to rob a home run that he seemed like he almost got. It was really frustrating. Uh, maybe, maybe you never would have gotten it. Maybe you shouldn't have jumped for it. And, you know, it's easy to a nitpick in hindsight but if it Garcia has to go on the IL or even if he even if he doesn't I think it's time for Evan Carter I've been saying this for about a week after you know months of saying no 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 it's not quite time for Evan Carter but I mean the Rangers need something and Evan Carter is not going to fix this bullpen this bullpen is still a hot mess express for sure and uh, it would be really nice if he could come in there and uh, you know be a all-star closer that would be a nice thing, and if he was, then the Rangers would have called him up months ago. Um, but he's not. He's an outfielder, and this outfield has been mostly pretty decent. I mean, left field has been questionable at times, but Robbie Grossman has been a serviceable player against against left-handed pitching. I mean, defensively, he's kind of still a little bit of a nightmare, which is not expected with his reputation coming in. But for the most part, he's been serviceable to find. But the left-handed bats, the left-handed outfielders on this team – that have been, you know, mostly pretty good. Travis Jankowski has had um, mostly a really great season, but his OPS before August was around 813, I believe. It's now all the way down to 690. 690. And JP Martinez, the guy who was brought up to be, you know, some kind of a spark of a, a outfield bat to, you know, hit the ball hard and, you know, work good at bats and play decent defense in the outfield. He's got... 17 games under his belt, 44 plate appearances, and a 575 OPS. He, he's not getting the job done either. So I think that means that it's time for Evan Carter, especially, especially if Adoles Garcia has to spend any time on the injured list. Like, you just cannot roll out Travis Jankowski out there every day. He was a really fun, great story that, you know, was really playing way above his head for, you know, what, four months out of the season? And that's great. That's absolutely great. I mean, he was a big part of this team's success, and he really played an important role. But we all kind of knew 
all right, there is a reason the Rangers were willing to cut bait with this guy. Um, if not for the Leo Di Tavares injury at the beginning of the season, Travis Jankowski would not have made this roster at all, and I don't think anyone would have lost a lot of sleep over it. And that's not to bash Travis Jankowski. I mean, maybe the move will be to, I don't know, put J.P. Martinez on or down to the minors and, you know, DFA, I don't know, Brad Miller. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what the corresponding move would be, but I, I'm not really too hung up on the particulars because it feels like this team needs something. I think Evan Carter can bring that. And I think that the, the risk that you take when you call up a prospect too early, we've seen it hamper guys in the past, like Anderson Tejeda, who never really recovered from it. Like Sam Huff, I think it really didn't do him a whole lot of good. Like Leody Tavares, all those guys being called up way before they were ready in 2020, way before they were ready. I think it really hampered their development. And I think we've kind of seen it for the last few years, especially the next couple of years after that. I mean, Anderson Tejeda was just never the same, just never the same. And we saw what happened when you call guys up too early out of desperation in 2014 with Rugnado Door, where they have a little bit of success and then they don't work on any of their flaws because they think, oh, I had success at the big league level. So why do I need to change anything? And they don't change anything and they don't get much better and they you know, don't get anywhere close to their ceilings. And I don't think that's going to happen with Evan Carter. Evan Carter is a very polished, mature 21 year old. Like he is very much a grown up in a, you know, child's body who's stick six, four and one, whatever, however much he weighs, doesn't matter. <laughs> he is very much a grown adult. He is already married, has a, a dog, you know, has the, the whole Mets priority. Dude has his life together very much. So as a 21 year old, which honestly might be more impressive than the stuff he does on the baseball diamond, just being a 21 year old, that seems that well put together with all the pressures and, and stresses that come with being a top prospect, come with being a top prospect. That's in range of the big league club where people will go out and see you and see this team struggling and think, let's get this guy up there. Now let's, let's go do it now. And a guy who had success in spring training, I mean, he hit well against big leaguers in spring training. I know it's spring training. It's not the same thing as a big league regular season game. It's definitely not the same thing as a big league stretch run, but the kid has such a good head on his shoulders that I don't think even if he comes up to the big leagues and he struggles, or if he has success, that it's going to stunt him in the way it has other prospects. And that's why I think that you know, Chris Young has even said that we're considering all possibilities. I mean, th this is a possibility you have to consider. You, I mean, you have to have been considering all year. But I think a few months earlier, it would not have been the time, especially when he was going through those struggles. But when he was going through those struggles, the thing that I said of when we are going to see Evan Carter in the big league level is when he goes through those struggles and then he works through them and gets past them and gets back to doing what he does in kicking butt and taking names and getting on base and working long counts. Because he, he does the things that, you know, when Travis Jankowski was going right, he worked a lot of long at-bats. He would get on base. He would steal bases. He would play good defense. That is what Evan Carter does. But Evan Carter has a smidge more power than the one home run, uh, one triple in 100, 278 plate appearances that Jankowski has. He just, he just does. I don't think his power is elite by any means. I think he's still got some work to go, some some you know muscle to to build on he is still just 21 years old so he's gonna fill out a little bit more I, I think and hit for a little bit more power than he has this year but for the most part Evan Carter is always going to get you competitive at bats no matter who he's facing off against he's always going to be able to provide that defense he is always going to be very pesky in the lineup I mean eight games in Round Rock so far he's got a 436 on base percentage and 462 plate appearances with Frisco this year. He had a 411 on base percentage and an 862 OPS. Like the guy just gets on base. He is his nickname is FCC, Full Count Carter, because he is always working full counts. He is always working deep at bats, and that is something that this lineup desperately needs. As much as I really like, as much as I really like Ezekiel Duran, that's not something that he necessarily provides. He's not providing as much thump as he was early on in the year, but he's still working okay at bats and getting decent results and getting on base and walking more at a better clip. But Evan Carter, that is his number one skill, is getting on base. He is incredible at it, along with the great defense, along with the great arm. Where I'd, I'd much rather, if if there is any time that Adolis misses, I don't want to see Robbie Grossman in right field anymore. I just, I can't do it. I, it's just, I don't know why it's so much more of an adventure than him in left field, but it just is. And I cannot bear the sight of Robbie Grossman in right field anymore. He's a little below average to serviceable in left field um, defensively. But he's just, 
I don't know why it feels like infinitely worse in right field, but it, it just does. And Evan Carter's got the ability to play all three outfield positions. He's played mostly left field and center field this year in Frisco and in Round Rock. But I mean, he can play everywhere. He's got a decent arm, not like not a Dolis's arm, not Leoti's arm, but it's it's solid. It's fine, above average, maybe even plus. I don't know. I haven't seen him make that many throws in person and get a good judge on it or talk to too many people about his arm. I'm more worried about his power and his on base and and yada 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 because that, those things are generally more important because I think overall in the future he's not going to be a right fielder. I think he's going to be a center fielder or a left fielder. And I think maybe Wyatt Langford is the one who ends up in right field. Cause I think his arm is just a smidge better, but what, Wyatt Langford is a different case. If you're asking me if they should call up Wyatt Langford right now to, to fix this offense, that I would say you're crazy town banana pants because the kids had like 40 games in pro ball and was drafted this year. This team is not the angels. They don't need to do that. Okay. The angels did that out of the most desperate, their whole draft strategy, the last like five years has just been, get the guy who's closest to the big league so we can rush him there so we could maybe win one or two more games. And it just has not worked out. I mean, it's working now. And kind of much to my very much surprise, a guy, I think Noah Shanuel, is that who it is? The first baseman they drafted out of, I believe it was Florida Atlantic, who seemed like the most draft-ready guy who was already up in the big leagues. And they drafted him. He's been up in the big leagues for, I think, like 10 games at this point and had a seven-game hitting streak to start his minor league career. Maybe it was more than that, but I remember it at seven, but, but still this team doesn't need to do that with Wyatt Langford, but Evan Carter is a different kind of guy. He's a different kind of cat that, I mean, the makeup as much as the tools is what I think the Rangers saw in him that they really liked about him and why this wouldn't be overwhelming. And I mean, this team needs some kind of spark, like just something. I mean, after that miserable gut punch, nut kick, just beating absolutely annihilation at home in front of your fans coming off a walk-off win where you thought okay maybe this is where you start to turn things around the answer was an emphatic no not yet you're not turning it around yet and I mean there's only so many buttons that Bruce Bochy and clubhouse talks and yada 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 can inject but having having Evan Carter come back or come up and then following that up with like a week later, Josh Young coming back. I mean, they need something in the worst way. And I don't think the risks are that big to where they would outweigh the potential rewards of calling him up. There's a chance they call him up and he gets exposed and he gets his lunch eaten. That's possible. That won't make me think any less of Evan Carter's future if for a month when he was 21 and had played, what, eight games in AAA? he got eaten up by big leaguers in a pennant chase. It, I will not think any less of his future for that happening to him, but I think he's going to provide you a lot more value than Julio Pablo Martinez. He's going to provide you a heck of a lot more value offensively than Travis Jankowski. Even though he's not the veteran, the kid is mature beyond his years. And like I said, if you can get some kind of spark to get this 21 year old kid into this lineup, not that he's some big outspoken guy who's going to jump in and rah, rah. And yeah, guys, let's do it. He's just going to get in there, get in the lineup, provide you some really good at bats, provide you some good defensive plays. And uh, I don't know, maybe run into one or two at the big league level and in a critical spot, but he is a winning type of player, a type of player that can help any team. And this team can use all the help it could freaking get because they are in the roughest way. If they want to salvage this season, end the playoff streak or the playoff drought and end the seasons in a row of losing seasons, just, just avoid that. If you, if you end the season with a losing record, that's just an completely hideous, ugly look for this team. I think Evan Carter will help you at least avoid that embarrassment. He might not fix everything on this team, but Hey, this team needs a spark, and I think Evan Carter is is the one to provide it. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing, and until next time, don't forget to enjoy life outside of baseball, maybe, for today.